You hear that? That must mean one thing. It's October. The only month for strangers showing up in front of your house to rob you in costume is normalized. There are so many things I love about this month. Trick or treating was a blast whenever I was younger. The cheap candy afterwards, the creative costumes, making jack o lanterns, rest in peace, Fredrickson, and just so much more. There were so many ways to celebrate that no two places are gonna do it the same. Just like how two video games of the same genre aren't gonna do it the same. And before we say, oh wow, Daniel, why do you say that? Did you not take a look at the title and thumbnail? If that's what I thought, use your brain for once. <laughs> If you did look at the title and thumbnail, good job, but if you didn't, I'm going to review and compare the false Castlevania game and the false Ghosts and Goblins game. As I said earlier, no two places are going to celebrate Halloween the same. Ireland has the annual Samhain Parade, which is basically like a Halloween celebration. In Italy, they basically combine Mexico's Day of the Dead with a mini Christmas. In Japan, they don't do trick-or-treating. And in America, sexualize, vulb, make sexual, attribute sex or sexual to. Oh no! As you can tell, all of those are wildly different, and video games, in the day's case platformers, also do it wildly differently. For example, take a look at Yumi Kojo, Doki Doki Panic slash Dream Factory, Heart Pounding Panic slash Doki Doki Panic slash Super Mario Bros. 2 in the US, and Mega Man. Both are platformers that came out in the same year, but they're both wildly different. If anything, it just depends on what style of platform you're going for. Do you want something more silly and goofy? Or that and serious when the time is right? Yeah, that's right. It depends on what you're after and what the devs are going for. However, if I'm going to take a look at these two similar or different games, I'm going to need a segment. Because if the inspection, the web series you're watching right now, is where I take a look at media like games, I can't make a series comparing the two even though I could do that. So, I think it's only fitting with the loose detective branding of a magnifying glass that the first level segment on Dan's inspection is called cross-examination. The, the out of thing lawyers do in court. If the two games are the direct examination, then it's my job to do the cross-examination to find out all of their differences. Granted, it may not fit the exact definition of cross-examination, but I think it's close enough to fit the specific need. How cross-examination is going to work is that I'm first going to take a look at one aspect of a game, for example, a batch of stages, and then the same exact thing in the other game or games if it's more than two. And I guess it is a very fitting that both Castlevania and Ghosts and Goblins have six chapters throughout. Funny how that works out. So, you might be wondering which game I'm going to be taking a look at first. And since I am just a sucker for dates since I am a week older than YouTube when it was founded, the first game I'm going to be taking a look at is Castlevania. Castlevania was developed and published by Konami, known for the beloved game series such as Metal Gear The Solid, Shh, The Hills, Become Roadkill, and so many more. Castlevania has you play as Simon Belmont, a descendant of a legendary vampire hunter. The main antagonist of the game and series is who else but Count Dracula, a vampire and sorcerer. He suddenly reappeared 100 years after Simon's ancestors got rid of him, but like all base things, they never die. Castlevania has all sorts of sequels, the coarse one, the third one, the 16-bit one, and so many more. The story of the false Castlevania game is insanely simple. You're here to destroy the forever curse of the evil count. Unfortunately, everyone wants you dead. Bats, zombies, fish people, boards, leopards, knights, skeletons, Frankenstein, Igor, a mummy, a hunchback, an axe-wielding man, not me, a ghost, death himself, and even <laughs> Medusa? What the? Okay, I guess this version of the count is Greek. And they are just everywhere with a few exceptions. There's six floors which are meant to be six chapters, each one ending with a boss fight. Thankfully though, using a weapon to weapons within the walls, everything should be fine. Right? Well, either way, Dracula has been pissed for 100 videos and only you can take him on. Apparently. The cover for Castlevania also just looks really cool. I feel like I'm looking at a movie poster. Some real David vs. Goliath stuff going on here. I really like how the colors complement each other. The sky is blue, while Dracula's castle and Simon are yellow, and the mountains on the castle are green. Perfect use of color theory. Easy 10 out of 10. Sounds cool. Really cool. I mean, I get to fight Dracula! Even though he could do so many things to me, I don't think YouTube would like it if I listed the things I'd let him do to me. But before I can be dominated by Dracula, you didn't hear that. But before we can fight the count, we first have to take a look at the Ghost and Goblins side of things. Ghost and Goblins was developed and published by Capcom, known for other beloved games and series such as Peak, Fight, Daganamto without the Daganamto but without the loyalness. Oh, and Kill Zombie Pew Pew. 
and some other ones in there. In Ghosts and Goblins you play as Awful, a knight in service of Princess Prinprin. The main antagonist of the game and series is Astaroth, the Demon King. Those out there who are fans of demons and such, good news, he's an actual demon known as the Great Duke of Hell. Not even a King of Hell. So, so very, very sad. Beta shit. The story of Ghosts and Goblins is that Astaroth told Satan to kidnap the princess, and he did. Because Arthur's job is to make sure Prim Prim is protected, he goes to rescue her. Very simple. The manual son of the beaver children in Castlevania did, for better or for worse. Like, seriously, this isn't even a paragraph. The cover of Ghosts and Goblins is a... Uh, well, it tells you how it is, that's definitely for sure. I do like how Arthur looks fucking pissed, he is not messing around. However, everyone is too focused on running those side of the battle to notice that the background is on fire. Very sad. The funeral service will be a few weeks from now. The back of the box actually has something to talk about. If I had to guess, these are hints for the game. Apparently, there are some hidden characters too, so maybe we'll see them. But hey, wait, why is there a guy in the top left? What is Captain Commando's Challenge series? You know, I feel like that can be a Dan Spection episode. But either way, with all of the information out of it, it's time to begin the reviews with Castlevania. Where do I begin with Castlevania? Well, I mentioned that the entire plot of the game is to basically kill Dracula, but considering the fact that he's a vampire, that isn't gonna be easy. Something felt felt the game because of how hard it is, and even in the opening road, Simon is in front of Dracula's castle. I said the cover felt like some David vs. Goliath stuff, and that applies here too. I also really like the music. It feels so action-packed and like the states are really high, pun not intended. The main one mentioned that we have all sorts of weapons, our main one being the whip. It starts off weak, but we can quickly level it up. And to be honest, I don't understand why we don't stop for the strongest form, this just seems kind of pointless. But we have all sorts of side weapons, including but not limited to an axe, a dagger, a boomerang, all of a sudden, and Jesus. Oh, no, right, the cross. Yeah, same thing. I have no real clue where his heart has a main power, so it's not, I don't know, maybe pages of a book to represent the Bible? If hearts don't replenish your lives, what does? Simple, the pork chop. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. There's also movement. In most games, it feels good, slippery, or very, very jarring. And I think on this scale of movement I just invented, moving around and slamming feels okay, but it's a little jarring at times. The walking is fine, the crouching is very annoying at times, but the jumping is where the jarringness comes in. You see, for some reason, Simon can't control how he jumps and he just jumps in an arc. This would be fine if it wasn't for the fact you can't have a say in how he jumps. You press the button, it's a regular jump. You hold the jump button, regular jump. There isn't much to say in how it walks. I can, however, say that for some reason you can't look around when jumping or attacking. Why can't we do that? We can do that in Mega Man, and Mario, kinda. In fucking Ghosts and Goblins, you can at least turn the other way. There's also the fact that Simon will sometimes move back whenever he gets hit. This is also fun, but the game has so many death pits it isn't even funny. You're gonna to need to act like you're a task bot when it comes to killing enemies to make sure you don't die. You can also just sort of fall into them, and Simon falls so heavily. Like, I can see why, but it's fairly jarring to hit the ground going Mach 5. Oh yeah, and speaking of die, if you die you end up at the start of the stage, and if you do manage to die enough to get a game over, which you will, you restart the chapter you're in. This is actually really nice of the game to do considering how difficult it is. And there's also the map so you can see where you, the bosses, and the sections out of the stages are. Knowing how difficult this game is, that's really nice of them to do. Super Mario Bros. doesn't even let you restart the chapter. You die, you go to the end, fuck you. Wah. In terms of this game having it out for the player, I fell through a moving platform. And get this, I hit the side of the spike, and then I died. Which isn't how it works at all. If I touch a nail, I'm not gonna scream in agony. Oh hey, look at that, a giant vampire bat. This thing is huge, it's right and Simon is tall, but fighting him is really easy with something like an axe, which gives him the perfect time to talk about the stairs. The way you use your side weapons like the axe is first by pressing up on your controller, then by pressing the attack button. Simple. However, if you want to use your side weapons by the stairs, then good luck, because if you're close to them, you're going to walk up them when you press up. So, you're walking up the stairs when you want to use your weapon. So you go down and move away some until you see you're moving up them again. I really don't see why we couldn't just switch to weapons with select. That would eliminate this whole situation. But, you know, it's still a giant bat. They aren't that hard to kill. Don't ask me how I know. I actually really like this boss fight though, since it isn't too difficult. And after defeating every boss, we walk into an orb to continue and get our health back. This is just... Why? Couldn't Konami just do that without us needing to go and do an orb? I don't know why, but this just seems like a pointless middleman. And yes, this criticism applies to Mega Man 1 too. I actually really like the bosses later on. 
After the vampire bat that was Medusa for some reason, she can be pretty difficult but I find hiding in a corner when Spearman can put really walks. Although the first time I fought her I died which really hurt. No, I was so close. There are also smaller Medusa heads, so I guess the one we fought is a queen. The smaller heads just sort of move in a wave across the screen. This can be pretty annoying at times having to dodge them, but it's not that bad. Right? There's also dragon skull cannons that shoot fireballs at your direction, and they're kinda annoying, but thankfully, you can whip the fireballs. Oh my god, hunchbacks. False. Do these even look like hunchbacks? No, they don't. They look like monkeys. There are also skeletons and ravens introduced in this chapter, but they aren't too annoying. Sometimes they can hit you, but the skeletons cannot hit you if they tried. And the ravens sort of just hover around you for the most part. I also feel like chapter 3 is where the game's difficulty really starts to shine. You see, there's a ton of skeletons and death pits later on, so you have to keep a close eye for them. And you also need to watch out for the Medusa heads later on. And oh wow, look at that, another dragon skull cannon. If the rest of the chapter those so far didn't lower your health, you got it easy. Because I didn't. Because oh look, it's the bosses. Yes, bosses. For some reason, Chapter Three's boss is two mummy men. The only reason why I was able to beat them without ripping my hair was the pork chop over here and spamming in the corner like I did in Medusa. Thankfully, this game doesn't have a long duration of invincibility frames, and that both mummy men stayed close to each other so I could get hits on them both. I am so sorry if you didn't or don't get as lucky as me. This boss fight is way harder than it needs to be. Chapter 4 is where everything goes to shit. Okay, well, if not, then explain why this place looks like the sewers, but... Medieval sewers. And fishmen. So many fishmen. In my notes, I wrote that this section takes place in an underwater cave, and I guess that also explains the amount of fishmen here, and the amount of times you're going to go through blocks. Yeah, that seems like a, a really good way for them to pounce you. Thankfully, after exiting the cave slash shivers, we are greeted with giant eagles dropping hunchbacks onto us. Has the world gone mad? I literally have zero clue how he made it to the boss fight without letting the eagles and hunchbacks destroy me. There's also skeleton dragons who really, and I mean really, love to just be a fucking dick. It's not even funny, I did manage to easily kill the first one when I was getting footage though. And now the boss fight, I hate it. I'm barely gonna talk about it because it's Finkenstein's monster and I go, a hunchback. I feel bad for Finkenstein's monster, he didn't ask to exist, and I think the hunchbacks in this game can go lick a razor blade and a candy apple. Like seriously, how is this fail? This, I can only stun at it, but lord forbid I can kill him, I, you know, I did beat it. On to chapter 5. FUCKING HUNCHBACKS! But hey, look at the funny red skeletons! They act like 5 owns in Mario games with skeleton gels in Mega Man 4 because they cannot be destroyed. Don't know if they can be, don't care- OH MY GOD MORE HUNCHBACKS I'M GOING INSANE AGAIN! Okay, 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 these guys are axemen. Yes, that's what they're called. They throw an axe at me, but it walks like a boomerang. Yeah, that makes sense. In my notes, I wrote that they fucking blow. But honestly, all it is is just me getting fed up with the game at this point. Like, yeah, they take nine hits, but it's better than taking a billion. Not too long after that, there is. Okay, well, if you've seen an old review of this game, you know what I'm talking about, so, uh, I'll just play the clip. The hardest part in the entire game, besides Dracula, is the hall right before the Grim Reaper. You have Medusa heads coming at you from both directions, and two knights throwing axes at two different altitudes. I mean, look at the pattern going on here. Anything that hits you drains a quarter of your health, so that means four hits and you're dead. Oh, but the knights, the knights take nine hits. Nine fucking hits. You can't even concentrate on attacking them because you're too busy dodging Medusas, but you can't dodge the Medusas because you're too busy dodging the axes, but you can't dodge the axes because you're trying to hit the knight, but you can't hit the knight because the game's driving you fucking crazy! Yeah, this part was, um, annoying. And as his note said, everything takes one foot for your health, meaning that you need to stay on your toes at this point. But most people can't do that. I somehow didn't manage to push them both back into despawning without dying. So who knows, maybe I'm some gaming king or whatever. Nah. <laughs> And speaking of dying, we fight death. And to quote myself from my notes, I have never wanted to invent an immortality mold. That is how annoying he is. Death summons sickles from god knows where to attack them, and since they stack up quickly, you need to get rid of them while being sure to hit death every now and then. It also doesn't help that house time and move sucks for this boss fight. It's so unfairly difficult that it'll put hair on your chest and hair on your chest. Yeah, you're gonna go through double puberty, that's how annoying it is. Also, the sickles can hit you after you defeated death, meaning that death himself is inescapable, and one day Simon will never hear the end of this. Chapter 6, the last chapter, 
I could bother going in depth for this, but just do fucking hunchbacks again, go away! Farm the hearts. You will need to do it in order to win. I'm saying it now, the Nord said it 13 years ago, farm them. Phase 1 of Jackless fight is kind of annoying, but Phase 2 is just so ugly. Where is my heart on then, man? ID main and those Konami, I wanna be dominated, I said it on camera again. <laughs> I am very grateful it isn't that difficult since I'm going for the head. Thankfully, phase 2 is just slightly more difficult, but I think I'll let the footage speak for itself. Oh, fuck you. The ending is trackless cast getting destroyed, and a parody of the end credits were iconic people who worked on horror movies and such have their names changed. At least, I think so. But, as Simon Belmont, we played the greatest role in this story. A white guy. <laughs> and you know, just in case if you feel like it, we could play again, but we're gonna have to take a look at Ghosts and Goblins, so here's what I think of Castlevania. The game is... good. The movement isn't that bad, the weapons are all useful but don't overpower the whip, there's some iconic stuff like fighting Dracula, the fall into chapter 3, and so much more. And the music man, oh my god, it's so good. But just, it's it's so difficult at times. Thankfully, it feels like Addis Falls is the last stage before Chapter 6, but why? Why does it have to be there and not at the end of the game? Granted, this isn't my experience, so maybe Dracula's fight made you want to implode. I don't know. I'm gonna give Castlevania and I 7.2 out of 10 pieces of garlic bread. It's really difficult, but it feels really good whenever you beat the game. And the music, it makes me feel so cool. No, not that cool. And for this segment of cross-examination, I'm going to give Castlevania and I 7.8 out of 10 for difficulty. There should not be so many more things I can think of where I just want to call up and do a ball and grind just because... Why? It gets so difficult in Chapter 3 and stays difficult until the end of the game. And if you want to play this game, either do it on an emulator so you can rewind in Turbo, not saying how, do it on official hardware with a Game Genie, Nintendo lost that case anyways, and just be happy it didn't send you back to the beginning after every death. Now that we know why I think Castlevania falls, it's time for us to take a look at Ghosts and Goblins as a game. I do feel the need to mention that recording the gameplay took around 30 minutes less than Castlevania did, but that doesn't necessarily mean I think the game is difficult. In fact, it might be even harder, and that is what I am here for. Difficulty. N -ness. Yeah, I just cut me off in the transition. Ghosts and Goblins. I really don't think it's promising if the demo game plays a... Uh, uh, that. Like, I know the whole point of a demo is to give the player a taste of what's to come, but this also doesn't even leave the starting area most of the time. Even Super Mario Brothers had Mario move to advance 1-1 one, one somewhat, but whatever. If you can understand what you mainly do in Ghosts and Goblins from this, you're... unique. I mentioned earlier that the entire plot of the game is to save Princess Prin Prin from Astaroth, but we actually saw the game off with... What? Why is Arthur wearing only his underwear who's almost right there? I, I mean, maybe it's just that he has a lot of muscles and stuff. Yeah. Muscles. But, oh my god, Satan shows up and kidnaps the princess. This is... intense. Well, a thousand tenths as an NES game at the time would allow. Arthur doesn't even skip putting his arm on. This man means business. I think the music is pretty decent. The latest stage's music fails to keep me heavily invested in it, but it's hard for me to hate the full stage's background music. In my situation, most music manages to warm its way into my head, and this is no exception. The main note goes over what you'd expect a manual to do. Who the hidden characters are, who the enemies are, bounds, characters, weapons, stuff like that. And speaking of weapons, almost none of them are needed. Seriously, only the sword is needed for most of the game until the second to last boss fight. And in that case, you can use the shield, but more on that later. I feel like movement in this game is actually pretty decent. The jumping feels fine except the halting landing, and when you get hit, you get pushed back like in Castlevania. And I did mention earlier that you can look both ways in the air, but you can't move left or right. I wonder if that's a bug or something, but I'll probably never find out. Something I know that isn't a bug is the fact that throughout the entire game, we only have two hits before we die. Yes, two hits. Granted, there are extra lives in this game will send you back to the start or checkpoint of a chapter, but two hits? That is insanely unfair. Especially since half the time it doesn't even make sense. I refuse to believe that a little raven and a fucking devil can remove my armor, my same armor that rarely responds. Did Capcom just think that the players would excel in this game? Was this some sort of sick, sadistic, sociopathic joke? I don't know. 
It also doesn't help that just about every other enemy needs to be hit so many more times than you to die. The Red Devil, one of the most annoying enemies in this game, free to fall, D Unicorn, needs 10, and I could just keep on going. At least whenever you kill an enemy, the blood shows up more than get engulfed in flames. And if you don't think that's Blood of Fire, you tell me what you think this is. Mortal Kombat didn't exist yet, and Knife Trap wasn't a thing, so this game had zero ESRB rating. That is blood in an NES game. Actually, speaking of the unicorn, here he is. For a first boss, it isn't that difficult. The spam on the sword and him can do the job. Actually, the sword looks more like a dagger. It's way too small to be a sword. Also, what knight uses a javelin? You know, no offense or anything, but when I think of knights, I think of men in armor wielding swords. Eh. Each their own. Chapter 2 has difficult platforming and even more difficult enemies. The blue demons will hover around you waiting to attack like a housefly and... Oh my god, go away! I'm not even reviewing a Mega Man game right now! And how could we forget about the petite devils? They don't look like devils, they look more like something out of the Moomins. I'm not gonna go into depth, but look at this. And now look at the petite devils. Yeah, while I know, same thing. Not too long after that, there are all these enemies called Big Men. Yeah, that's just funny. So many big men are in this game. So big, so stupid, so mind-numbingly annoying. Good luck dealing with them since they just love, and I mean love, to camp above you half the time. I'm also sure you realize that in the top left, there's a time limit, and you don't get that much time. Ghost and Goblin Chapter 2 gives you 1 minute and 30 seconds exact, but Castlevania's Chapter 2 gives you 7 minutes! And it's so easy to waste time because of what I wrote in my notes, the ladders, but in actuality, it's a hardware problem. Because if you press down a needle game your couch, but if you switch to pressing bottom left or bottom... Bottom? Because if you press down a needle game your couch, but if you switch to pressing bottom left or bottom light... Light? Oh my f Because if you press down a needle game your couch, but if you switch to pressing bottom left or bottom right, then just left or right, you'll stay crouching. I understand why this happens, but it's still annoying since I myself hold down until I'm off the ladder. At the end of chapter 2, we have to fight two unicorns because... I don't know. I understand I'm using bosses and I do appreciate how it's two unicorns to make it more difficult, but it still feels kind of wild to see. But the only thing more drawing is how- OH MY GOD BADS! RUN AWFUL! RUN FOR YOUR LIFE! Damn it! Yeah, I have no idea why they would put this here. That, and the fact that chapter 3 might as well be the Red Devil Sanctuary. There's so many and it's even more complaining about. I still have the rest of the game to talk about, but for here, just, just no. Oh yeah, and also the two petite devils here feel like an insult to an ongoing injury. It just makes no sense and it contradicts what the manual says, and I feel like I made a good point when recording the gameplay. In a sane world, the devil, this fucking red idiot, would literally just stick to the same moving over and over again. But no, that's too easy. It doesn't make sense at all that the red devil knows when you're gonna jump, but whatever. The boss this time is actually a dragon. After the unicorns and red devils, this is welcomed. It isn't that difficult to fight, you can just sort of go for the head and you'll be fine, or you can go for the body throne to rack up extra points. Oh my god, moving platforms! Oh my god! Oh wait, it's kinda like a puzzle. Cool, I guess. Yeah, chapter 4 really isn't all too memorable. Like, there is the part with the moving platforms, the part with the bridge, and that is it before the boss fight. It even reuses dragon which we just fought in chapter 3. I would just be treading all the ground if I tried to find something to talk about. Oh god, skeletons! I hope they're not like my skeleton who was the most foul skeleton ever! Lord help me if he could speak because I could not be able to upload anything at all. For some reason, Chapter 5 immediately throws a blue demon at us. Am I even surprised anymore? And back to the skeletons. They really, and I mean really love Fleet Frog. Maybe one day they'll go pro. I wrote in my notes that this section does feel the most platforming out of the rest, and I have no idea what I was thinking when I wrote that. Like, yeah, ladders. Platformer, eh? I did actually manage to get armor. For the first time, walking on this video. And I think I said it best myself. Yeah, that is the first time that has ever happened. Like, the first time I was taking notes, and now this, like, that is the only time that has happened, so I feel like that says a lot about how difficult, unnecessarily difficult, too, this game should be, because it's not a bad game. It's just not a fail game. Don't get me wrong, I think you should make any help somewhat difficult, but if that's the first time I got it when getting notes and recording gameplay, there was something wrong with your game. Castlevania has so many more pork chops in the throughout, and Super Mario Bros. has hidden run-ups throughout the level, the infinite live trick, and gives you a one up if you land on top of the flagpole, or collect 100 coins. I can only assume that Ghosts and Goblins is doing what Mega Man does by randomizing the enemy drops depending on how often you move. So, if I were to jump, 
it would end up switching from some points to health. But again, this only happened once, and not to mention you can easily fall on enemies for health and weapon energy in Mega Man. Oh my god, it's Satan! And oh my god, he's flashing us! Surprisingly, he is very easy, especially when compared to Red Devils. In my opinion, just spamming really, and I mean really, works. Like yeah, he isn't easy, you can see me saying screw it and rerunning in the gameplay, but there's a lot more Satan to hit than the Red Devil to hit. I sure do hope I won't have to fight him again! Yeah, foreshadowing. Yippee. Chapter 6 is sort of like a boss rush, where we kill one of each boss we had before now. One unicorn, one dragon, and so many skeletons, red devils, and big men. Like, I get it, this is the final section in the game, but just nah, -uh, No. For whatever reason, Capcom managed to pick the worst combinations of enemies to deal with. And on top of that- Oh my god! Two flashing satans! Thankfully it isn't that bad to fight both of them, but the thing is that you need to fight them with the shield, and the shield as a weapon just sucks. They are only good for killing Satan and Astroff, but you need it to beat the game, so what are you gonna do? Well, kill all the enemies, and before you go to the boss area, go and get the shield because if you don't, well, you can't beat the game, it sends you back to chapter 5. Yeah, for some reason the devs thought, hey let's make it so you need the shield when literally every other weapon besides the sword sucks. Oh, and the shield only spawns in level 6 because that's fail. Hint, it's not! Getting the shield and killing both Saiyans isn't even that easy since you have seconds left to spare. After defeating the two Saiyans, we meet the devil slash Astaroth, who was holding the princess captive. Thankfully, Finding him with the shield isn't that difficult. All you need to do is go for head and you can just spam, spam, spam your way to victory. Yes! Finally! Oh my god! Oh, well, that was goes and comments, and before I can put it to you, I'm gonna have to... Wait a minute, but, um, this room is an illusion, and is a trap devised by Satan. Go ahead, dauntlessly. Make rapid progress. D d d d oh, d what the hell? I'm gonna have to play for the game again. I, I, I yeah, no, this is bullshit. Um, um, what's something that no one would say? This is like if you were to make a really in complex building and, and the guy paying you to make it gives you praise, but then he he but uh, um. Uh, he destroys it and tells you to build it again to get the money you would rightfully dissolve. Yeah, something something like that, I think. Um, although I'm more certain before I start swearing, let me just do a little bit something. Oh yes, finally! I did it again! Congratulations, the story is happy and thank you. Being the wise and courageous knight that you are, you feel strength welling in your body. Return to starting point, challenge again. What? Okay, all little games had poor translations, maybe Maybe one day I'll talk about it, but really? I like at least I gotta thank you. Just God, really? I I I have to be playing a game for Dad? I did. Yeah, let's let's rank this. If Castlevania is like riding a bike that's on fire, Ghosts and Goblins is like riding a bike where everything is on fire. Don't get me wrong, there are all things about these games I like. The first song we hear is iconic. The movement is decent, and the graphics age right are fine. It just doesn't have anything to write home about, though. 
Some of the game is forgettable, the difficulties is apparent from stage 1, and even though they're all a good handful of weapons, you can only have one, and only two are needed, the sword and the shield. It also doesn't help that the bosses are reused and doubled endlessly, and that you only have two hits for out, while Castlevania gives you four hits at the end of the game. But I do think it is an okay game. It doesn't do anything big or grand, but it is pretty cool to see elements of a much bigger Capcom platformer here. So I guess, difficulty aside, I'm gonna give Castlevania 6.2 out of 10 ghosts, and goblins, although this game only has one of those, so yeah. It is really difficult, don't get me wrong, but clearly some people like really difficult games. So maybe this is the Dark Souls of NES games, I don't know, and I don't want to know. The ghost falls from just about every stage, and they are very annoying. Some of the later pieces of background music are also kind of forgettable. Obviously, they all can't be bangles, but it just feels like so much race and potential. And in terms of difficulty, Jesus Christ, this is getting an 8.4 out of 10 in terms of difficulty. To start, the fact that only the sword and shield are needed, the latter being in only the final state as far as I know, and that there's zero indication that you need it until you beat both Saiyans without the shield. You can't argue that they did say, and yes they did, but that isn't fail. After the boss fight? Really? Maybe in the manual they could've put more emphasis on the shield, like it's a holy shield? I don't know. I think saying it's a holy shield would hint at the fact you needed to defeat a devil who told Satan to kidnap a princess! There's also the fact that there's so many red devils, and they are just seemingly impossible to hit, and the fact you only have two hits. Like, I just feel like if they made this game a bit more forgiving, this would have been a lot more fun and a lot less agonizing. And I guess now we know which one of these NES games are harder in my opinion. Ghosts and Goblins. Both are very similar in the fact that they were well known and loved or hated NES games. Both games make sure you can never really go back to the start of the game when you get a game over, which is really nice. And both games' final bosses are all... Ugly, and you need to hit them in the head, but Castlevania is just easier since you don't need to play the game in order to beat it. And even though in that game you go from 8 hits to only 4 hits, that's a lot more fail forgiving and understandable compared to Ghosts and Goblins 2 hits foul. The music is also just better in Castlevania with the game's added pieces of background music being just as cool as the false piece in the game. I don't really know how to end this to be completely honest with you. I mean, I guess if I was Kid Icarus pre-2022 I would slaughter the game, but I don't want to do that. Don't get me wrong, I know when my tone was more negative throughout both games, but both games are really good, and I just wanted to know which one was harder, but now I do. And hey, there is one thing I can say, there's a lot less Ghosts and Goblins games than Castlevania games. So I imagine I could probably make a big review out of every Ghosts and Goblins game. Something to think about. Uh, can I... can I help you? Daniel, if you take a look at every Ghost and Goblins game, you're gonna have to fight a Sarah. There's a reason the player has to use the shield and play through the game again. He's trapped in the cartridge. Yeah, right. I'll leave it when I see it. Well, hopefully someday I'll be able to take a look at or just play both franchises' games respectively. Granted, that might be a little over in business with this and that, but, but whatever. Now, if you excuse me, I need to go take some baby's candy. Happy Halloween. Stay safe. Have fun, and be sure to get as much candy as you can by any means that'll legal. Oh my god, I completely forgot to say that I'm dressed up as the hunter from Left 4 Dead. Uh oh.